Ah, uh, yeah. Welcome, man. Welcome back to another episode of the Format Podcast. Got a pretty good show for you here today. And uh, I must say, as a lifelong Boston Celtics fan, I am in a pretty good mood this morning. So uh, bear with me. But before we get to that, you know what it is. If you haven't already and you're here on YouTube, please go ahead, click that subscribe, that like, and that notification bell so you can be made aware and stay up to date on whatever new content comes out on the channel. If you want the audio only version of the podcast, we're pretty much where uh, audio pa- podcasts are available. Open up your podcast platform, type in the format podcast in the search bar. Go ahead, search us, and uh, we should come up. And uh, when that happens, you can go ahead, you can subscribe right there and uh, do what you need to do. Um, if you enjoy the content, please give us that uh, that thumbs up or that five star review. We love that. It helps us rise in the algorithm, um, helps us find more sports fans, helps more sports fans find us. Now, let's get right to it. OK, so I can look at this situation two ways. What situation is that? The fact that the Los Angeles Lakers this morning are in a seemingly insurmountable hole. They are at an 0-3 deficit in the Western Conference Finals and have to win four straight to advance to the NBA Finals against the Denver Nuggets. That's highly unlikely, but, you know, nothing is impossible until it's done. I think uh, the great Nelson Mandela said that. Um, So anyway, um, this is interesting to me because, like I said, I got to look at this two ways, right? One, as an objective sports journalist, it is it's a story. LeBron James, of course, Los Angeles Lakers, basically the biggest team brand and the biggest individual brand in the NBA. And looks like, by the looks of it, that both of those are going to be out of the playoffs in very short order here. Um, From the fan side of it, as I mentioned, and you all know this, I'm a lifelong Boston Celtics fan. So even though we're in an 0-2 hole ourselves against the Miami Heat on the other side of the bracket in the Eastern Conference, as long as the Los Angeles Lakers lose and don't have success and they suffer and their fans suffer, that's always that's always a good thing for the Celtics fan. Quick side note, the beat LA chant that you often hear in Boston, that's not just a function of the Celtics uh, beating the Lakers. So if you ever noticed, I think it was back in uh, 1981, the Celtics lost to the um, Lakers. In, uh, so, I'm sorry, Celtics lost to the Sixers in the Eastern Conference Finals. And the Lakers had already uh, um, clinched their spot to play in the finals. And so Celtics fans, with their immeasurable hatred for all things Los Angeles Lakers, started chanting, beat LA, beat LA, beat LA, to tell the Sixers to go out there and get that job done. Maybe it was 1983. Maybe that was the faux, faux, faux year. I believe it was 1983. But anyway, the point is that's how the beat LA chant started. So it wasn't even about the Celtics. It was about uh, Celtics fans knowing that even though the Celtics weren't going to the NBA Finals, whatever representative from the East did go to the Finals, if they played against the Lakers, they had to beat LA. So. That's how it is if you're a Celtics fan. But anyway, I'm going to do the the rest of this pod from a uh, sports journalist standpoint. So, um, yeah, so last night, uh, the the Denver Nuggets go up 119-108 in this series. And like I said, that that 0-3 hole is seemingly insurmountable. I, I'm pretty sure no one's ever come back from 0-3 in, in um, Western Conference Finals or obviously the Finals. Now, again, until LeBron James and the Cleveland Cavaliers did it in 2016, no one had ever come back from 1-3 in the NBA Finals either. And we hear about that ad nauseum. And I am quite sure that tomorrow on all the sports media shows, Shannon Sharp is going to say, well, you know, oh, King James, oh, King, oh, GOAT. He going to do it. He going to do it, Skip, you know, and he's going to push that narrative. And maybe Nick Wright is going to come out, you know, and he's going to push that narrative. But realistically, I think this series is over. But I will say this. One thing you do not want to do if you're the Denver Nuggets is give LeBron James, one of the greatest playoff performers of all time, even a speck of hope or a speck of life in this series. You've got him down 0-3. You want to crush him. I don't even think you say, you know, uh, okay, we'll try to win the game four, but if not, we'll go back to Denver, close it out in game five. You, you don't want to do that. You got your foot on their neck. You want to keep stomping until they stop breathing. That's it, plain and simple. So um, if you're Denver, you definitely want to close this thing out. So from another angle, um, uh, a couple videos back, I, I did, I, I talked about it and I said that uh, the NBA most likely would want the Lakers and the Celtics in the finals because obviously two of the biggest brands, the two greatest historical brands in the league and, you know, tons and tons of storylines there. Of course, the year LeBron James breaks the all time NBA scoring record, an opportunity to uh, cap that with a championship that would have been incredibly historic. And that would have stolen thunder from the NFL during most of the offseason because it could have kept 
that GOAT argument going even more um, for those who believe there is actually an argument between LeBron James and Michael Jordan. But that would have been, you know, a great fodder for discussion all offseason long. And so the NBA definitely wanted that. It would have pushed ratings through the roof. So now you flip it and you say um, it looks like, again, seemingly insurmountable, but that's why they play the games, right? But it looks like uh, Denver Nuggets are going to go ahead and win this thing and be the Western Conference representative to the NBA Finals. And then on the flip side of the draw um, in the East, Boston Celtics are down 0-2 against Miami. Now, here's my thing, right? Now, I started off talking about how I'm a diehard Celtics fan. Now, let me be objective here. The Miami Heat are absolutely awesome. That Heat culture and the way Eric Spolstra coaches that team and develops his players, I'm going to say this. And I, I said it on social media a number of times, a number of places. I don't believe there's any way the Celtics are going to beat this Miami Heat team four times in five games. I just can't see it. Now, I know, um, you know, sports media is talking about how the Celtics are a very good road playoff team and all that, and that's fine, but you're not going to beat these guys four times in five games. I would be utterly and completely shocked if that took place because I'm looking at it and the Celtics have played some incredible stretches of basketball in this series, but the fact is the Heat never go away. You just can't put these guys out. Uh, you know, you, you you can't close them out in in, in a game when uh, when you're up big. And the Celtics have had a number of double digit leads in this series. And then the Heat just start banging away on these triples and they come right back in the game and they come back quickly. And then, of course, you got playoff Jimmy or Jimmy Buckets or whatever you want to call him, who's always right there doing his thing. So um, the Heat are a tremendous defensive team. They are shooting the three extremely well in the playoffs and they're extremely well coached. And I think in, in my uh, my estimation, the difference in that series is coming down simply to Joe Mazzulla's being outcoached by Eric Spolster. And there's no shame in that. Eric Spolster is one of the best coaches in the league. He's probably mm, top three or four, maybe top three. Um, so he's he's easily one of the best coaches in the league. He may be the, well, I was about to say he may be the best, but Coach Pop, so no. But um, he, he's definitely one of the best coaches in the league. So Joe Mazzulla is not going to outcoach him. Um, he also doesn't have the defensive chops, I think, to make the adjustments that an Emei Udoka would have last year. And just a quick side note before I get back to the um, the Lakers and, and the, the Nuggets, um, I'm watching these Celtics games and the Heat go on these runs and Missoula is just standing there. Like, I, to me, he doesn't seem to have a concept of when to call a timeout and try to break the momentum or, or make an adjustment to try and break the momentum. And then the Heat will go ahead and rattle off 15 or 20 in a row or a 15 or, you know, a 20 to five or a 17 two type run. We've seen these numerous times in this series. And it's like, what is going on? Like at those points in the game, Missoula, what are you doing? So um, very interesting, but again, I'll, I'll say it here being totally objective. I do not believe that uh, the Heat can lose four out of the next five games and not go to the NBA Finals. So what this sets up, is an interesting thing. Um, again, that Heat series, you, you got some time in it, but I, I do believe that they're gonna be the Eastern Conference representative. So um, the league is not gonna get what they want, which is very interesting. But now you actually get something totally different. You get Jimmy Buckets, playoff Jimmy, who is clearly one of the best playoff performers in the NBA, right? And he's gonna deal with Jokic and Jamal Murray, who Jamal Murray is turning into, uh, he's turning into the human torch in the, in the NBA playoffs here, right? He is doing amazing things, and um, that would be a heck of a matchup. You put Jimmy Butler on Jamal Murray and try to control him. But anyway, um, you look at that and you say, okay, well, this is a situation where uh, Jimmy, Buck Jimmy Butler has obviously been to the finals before. He's been to the finals in the bubble, but uh, Jokic has never been to the finals before. And there was so much talk about who is the best player in the world and did Jokic deserve to be the three-time MVP, so on and so forth. Embiid got it, and I'm also on record saying that Embiid should have been the MVP this year. It's a regular season award, and he should have. He had the best regular season. I'm also on record saying I believe that Embiid is the best center in the league, but my problem is he doesn't always play like the best center or the best player in the league. And the way Jokic has played through this playoff run, um, if he closes this thing out and gets a chip, I may have to back up off that and say he's better than Embiid until Embiid proves me otherwise, right? When the evidence is there, you can't hold on to a faulty premise. That's not what a logical person does. I consider myself a logical person. But anyway, um, so you would have a situation where you would have the Nuggets and the Heat, and those aren't two huge brands, but that's an opportunity to showcase two players that don't necessarily get the spotlight. And one of the two would get an opportunity to win the championship, and that would really uh, elevate themselves. Um, Spolstra and Pat Riley, they would also, if Pat Riley could be elevated anymore, right? But Spolstra 
would be further elevated to those who say maybe he's not uh, as great a coach as we think, but he benefited obviously from having LeBron James, Wayne Wade, and Chris Bosh for those four years with the Heatles. But um, he would lay to rest any argument like that. And of course, Pat Riley uh, would squarely put himself in position to maybe be regarded as the greatest executive of all time, him and Jerry West. Um, so there's that. Um, and then of course, on the flip side, Mike Malone would probably uh, vault himself up into, you know, that uh, top seven echelon coaches and Jokic clearly in the top three players in the league. So um, a lot, a lot, a lot to think about. But yeah, um, Denver and the Lakers. I want to see what the pro Laker media and and uh, the pro Laker fans, all of them are going to, well, fan is short for fanatics, so I don't necessarily respect too much logical response from them on this, but the pro, the clearly pro Laker and pro LeBron James media, I want to hear what they're going to have to say about all this tomorrow. Um, the other thing that's interesting to me is you look at um, LeBron and, like, you know, I did a show a while back called uh, Who's Got It Better Than LeBron or something like that, right? And he really does have the best of both worlds. Why do I say that? Because when LeBron James was chasing the scoring championship, he had all the energy in the world, right? He could do it. He's running out there. He's dunking on people. He's running all over the place. He's getting buckets. As soon as he gets a scoring title, and I've mentioned this before on the show, um, he quote unquote gets injured. Not saying he wasn't injured, but he's suddenly injured and can't go the same way. And he's out for a while. Then he comes back. He's supposed to be good for the playoff run. But now I'm not going to say he looks like a shell of himself, but clearly you can see Father Time uh, really has uh, done some catching up to him. And it's so interesting because when he plays great, it's you've never seen a 20 year player, an age 38 player play like this. But when he doesn't, it's well, he's 38 years old. What do you expect? Like he always gets the best of the situation placed on him. And undoubtedly, when the Lakers lose this series, and I would be shocked if they didn't, but when they do, um, we're going to hear about how he didn't get enough help, which is simply not the case because Anthony Davis has played relatively well through this playoff run. Austin Reeves, you know, the Lakers are role players are giving all they can as as role players are want to do. Um, but it's you will hear because you always do that LeBron didn't need enough help. And then we're going to see, you know, what what type of moves they're going to make in the offseason because you got to surround, uh, surround LeBron with more talent, so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, um, I'll say this for Lakers fans and pro Laker media with how incredible that brand and that franchise has been over its existence anything short of a championship is always failure so i get that as a celtics fan but even still nobody expected them to be where they are this season no one expected that so um shouts to the lakers for getting this far and, and again i'm talking like it's over i do believe it's over anything can happen that is why you play the games but i i don't believe they're going to be able to beat these guys four straight to to win um the western conference but we'll see anyway what i want to know from you is uh how do you think this uh this is all going to play out in terms of the pro lebron and pro, pro laker media do you think that uh, how do you think the nba feels about a possible miami and denver um uh, nba finals and uh how do you think Jokic and murray have played in this series and finally, um, do you think LeBron James needs more help? Looking forward to reading your comments. Leave those in the comments section. And uh, I'll be back with you next episode. And I'm out. Peace.